Welcome everyone to episode 71 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. Thanks so much for joining me, and if you celebrate, happy Easter to you. I've been really looking forward to this one, so we're not going to make him wait too terribly long here. If you enjoy Stargate, and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, and that's the wrong button. That's the right button. If you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal if you click the like button. It really makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will definitely help the show grow its audience. And please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes, which as if you've been watching the show, do happen from time to time. This is key if you plan on watching live. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several days on the GateWorld.net YouTube channel. All right, folks, it's the man of the hour. I've been waiting to have this guest on for a very long time. I was so excited when he accepted. It's not often that you get to talk to your heroes and people that you really admire. And with this show, I get to do that nearly every week. Let me welcome in Mr. Peter DeLuise. Episode 71. <laughs> It starts. Yeah, I love it. How yeah. are you? I'm very well. And to, just to add to that, that last little bit of information that you're giving your viewers, you don't have to like just this episode. You can go to every single episode on the YouTube channel and just keep pushing thumbs up all day long. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Am I right, David? Like my parents do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love your background. Did you take that? Yes. I, what a beauty. I, I was. This was on the set of uh, Stargate Universe, and I took, I'll get out of the way so you can see it closer up. You can see the detail. You can see the detail of the, uh, of the thing. It's the Jules Verne, the steampunk yeah. version of the, of the Stargate. <clears throat> yeah, I've always thought that Destiny's predecessor was the Nautilus. You know, it's just... It's so friggin' cool. That was my favorite Stargate. That was my favorite set. Lucky enough to see all three of them. But they, James C.D. Robbins was brilliant. Absolutely. Wasn't he still he, is brilliant. He, I mean, well, he's still alive, but, you know, he might not be challenged as much as he, he was. I mean, be good to be this, the, he was, the, the kind of stuff that he put out there was just breathtaking, I think. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm going to show you a couple of more pictures while I'm here, and then I will, I will spare you. So okay. this is... This is a darkened version from the back of the set. I, I took this as well. Mm. And then uh, um, I already showed you that one. So this is a close-up of the... Uh, the door. The, that was easy. That's the, the, the door thingy. Yes, the, the, I call it the that was easy. Do you have one of those? <laughs> yeah, the staples. Yeah, these, the, that <laughs> was easy. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Um, Good product placement. And then, yeah where's this one? okay so this one this is with the uh rear screen projection in so we had, right. a, we had a practical puddle that we would we would put a projection in and that was that was championed by jim menard who yes thought, you know there's no reason why we because it it was so it was so cost prohibitive to show the gate with the with the uh the uh puddle on mm. that we would stay off of it so jim jim correctly said why don't we create an animation Take a, a very powerful projector from behind, put a, put a, a projection screen in the thing itself, and then uh, just have our actors act in front of a, an, an actual screen. And there was a lot of hesitation because the, uh, the visual effects department said, well, what if it doesn't match the look of our, of our, our rendered uh, image? And, and um, so there was a lot of hesitation and a lot of hemming and hawing, but finally, it turned out, you know, uh, cooler heads prevailed, and and it it was it turned out to be the smarter uh, choice because mm -hmm. then you got to, you got to see it on camera way more, right? And exactly. here's here's one over the over the little control dashboard, right? Wow, Isn't that fun! When the set is lit, it's magic. It's absolutely it magic. Is. I Although I agree, I wonder who is directing the cast and crew when you're taking all these pictures. Oh, this may, this may have been during lunchtime. I don't know. <laughs> they were, or they were, or they were going for uh, maybe they were going for uh, uh, hair and makeup. So now I'm going <laughs> to take I'm, I'm going to take my I'm going to take off my background. And now I have to tell you that I felt very intimidated by your background because you have a lot of cool stuff. And of course, David Hewlett 
I watched uh, quite a few of your yes. episodes, and I saw that David David Hewlett's background is awe inspiring. He's got the blinky lights, and you've got the yeah, got I've got the the, you know, the, the, the Enterprise and, and the, the rotating Atlantis. Actually, I, I've got a couple of them. I've got another Enterprise over here. This was the tree topper that Hallmark released. But um, and I did not want it, and of course my parents said, "Well, we uh, we hope you decide that you wanted it because it was under the tree this year." But yeah, no, it's uh, a lot of these are um, fan made. The Hatak is fan made. That Stargate was just revealed, um, yeah. and yeah, Hatak, the Hatak is just Hatak is just such a better way of saying it than mothership. Mothership, Don't you agree? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, something we can upload oh. a virus into, and the Destiny. Is and the Atlantis are both fan made. They're just brilliant fan creations. I love them to pieces. And everything so, else so is David, from the you, show. Yeah. So so I'm watching your I'm watching your past episodes, right? To try to get a feel for what you do. And I, I think uh -huh. what you do is awesome. Oh, thank you. Absolutely Whew. awesome. Okay. Clearly, you're you're a you're a, a super fan of the show. You know so much about it. Uh, you you have an encyclopedic uh, recollection. Um of all the episodes it's it's like you just keep watching them over and over again they're so fresh right <laughs> and and then and then i see way back in the corner behind you it's not doing it now but in the past episodes you've had it, the atlantis model rotating yeah and, and i tried a lazy susan and it sucked because it was this cheap little motor and it was just like mm, 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 and i was like that's if, not if gonna you can't work. say if you can't say something nice about susan don't, don't <laughs> okay don't understood yeah. Okay, sorry. So that, then now you've got Big Big Bob over here behind you, who's yes. who, who, he's got a flashing thing on it, right? And you've got the Enterprise and it's flashing. And I'm thinking to myself, does he not want us to look at him? Because all the flashing <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so, and then I saw David Hewlett. David Hewlett's got his his opium den, right? <laughs> where he's got the 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 the, the, the jabot of, of, of colored LED lights. And I was like, I can't compete with this. So I was like, okay, what can I do? So I got a laser and I thought that'll, 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 uh, oh, you can't see it. Can you? No. There, maybe, maybe if I take off the lights here, can you see it now? No, I can't. No. About, oh, there it is. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's Legit. a shit. And so I was like, can you, you understand what I'm saying? It doesn't matter what I'm saying. Cause you got flashy cool <laughs> lights. Behind. So tell me about when you first had your testicles laminated. Huh? I, I don't, I didn't catch that. I can't see anything. I can't hear anything because of the lights flashing behind your head. <clears throat> well, let's talk about some of your toys. I see a uh, to infinity and beyond. Um, That's right. But buddy over there has got the. Yeah. The, uh, the, yeah. I've got to infinity and beyond. Do I see a robot the, on the desk there? Blue with red shoes. Yeah. Tin toy. You got the tin toy there. Yeah. Okay. Like there we go. Like yeah. You're still toys. a kid at heart. And then and, uh, I've, I've got, yeah. this was a crew gift I gave. Uh, uh, this is a, a crew gift I gave. It says, you can't really see this. It says, super great crew. S-G-C, super great <laughs> crew. That's how old this is. I have never used it, but it's still the image is faded. Uh. I've got my, uh, I've got my noisy, noisy cricket. Noisy cricket. cricket. Oh my gosh. Don't point cricket, that at baby. me. Wow. Yeah. That's legit. That's great. What a good movie. I've got uh, I've got uh, several reference books, uh, one of which I wrote an afterword for. And I've got oh, uh, this beautiful work of art, this deco. This is this is a ray gun made of glass. Wow. And it was created by by this artisan. Uh, it's upside down. Flip it is for it me. Upside down. Sorry. Yeah, this shut off. This amazing artisan if you want to do a, a frame capture of that. Okay, Jeff. I don't even know if he's I don't even know if he's still alive, but he is called Joe Blow Glassworks. And so this is blown, this is blown glass made to look like a, a, a ray gun, almost, almost, um, yeah, it's almost circa, circa, 1960s, circa, um, uh, Flash Gordon, yeah, Flash Gordon style, or earlier, right? yeah. And it so blown, and I'm, I'm going, this is made of glass, and then there's just one little, um, machine pit, a bit of uh, metal here. Wow, like, this is blown glass, and like, well, the, the key to this is. <clears throat> Getting the 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 glass to buy you dinner first before you get the blown glass, right? And well, I've got I've got a predator. I'm a big fan of predators, so I've got a couple of, of predators there. 
You are right? one handsome person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there's another ray gun. Yes. So this is made of a, out of an air gun. This wow. is machined out of an air gun. And this is also a, a, a beautiful work of art. And this was made by Perry, Perry Lang. Perry Lang. That's wow. His, that's his Aliens got you down. <laughs> so isn't that cool? Yeah, I love I love me some ray guns. <clears throat> my wife, my wife saw that I like that, and so she got me a, 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 the, these choice pieces, and They're I was beautiful. like, "This is great." Yeah, and I'm then, not going to ask um, you to show off Anne Marie next. Well, Anne Marie's Anne Marie's the best. <laughs> that, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. Then this is a junk bot that I created from uh, uh, re, re, uh, repurposed yeah. parts. Yeah. Look at that yeah, so it's little a, coaxial a, audio cable. Yeah. yeah you made so that's, that, Peter? That's, that's so cool. I made that out of, out of found up uh, pieces. Yeah. And so that that's a little bit of Johnny number five and Chappie and Wally. All in right. Part, exactly. Right? Yeah. Eva? Yeah, so cool, that's fun. Um, man. Yeah. I like that little guy. He's yeah. fun. And then I've got the. Uh, yes. The companions. you got the companions, right? So I did the afterward in the. In, uh, Let's see here. I got the afterward. Let's see. Uh, and a dedication from Thomasina. You know Thomasina. Thomasina don't Gibson. You? Met her once. Yes. Mm-hmm. She's wonderful. Well, she's lovely. She she's she uh, she said thank you so much for the afterward. I'm sure you'll sell, we'll sell many more millions of copies because you did that. <laughs> and then she didn't mention at all my 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 crappy grammar or my my shitty spelling. She was like, yeah, it's all good. Yeah. That's Thomasina for you. You know, she's great. Yeah. And then uh what else I got here? I got the Ultimate Visual Guide. Yes, you, it's you a great collection. One? Yeah. Absolutely. And it's up to I think season eight, if I'm not mistaken. Kathleen Ritter put that out, yep. And yeah. I think she got Rick to do the forward on that. This is amazing. So what she put together a lexicon that was absolutely invaluable. Yes. Uh, that was a really, really, really helpful uh, to all of us when we were writing it. And then, so, and she inspired me to, her work inspired me to, to collect all the uh, Goa'uld uh, words and, and create a document of those. Because up until that time, Nobody had, um, there was, you know, except for Cree and, and, and uh, the, the odd word here and there, there was no, you know, Collation. Def, definite way of, of expressing it. And we wanted to be consistent. So what I did is I went, I had a stack. I had a, just an absolute stack of um, scripts, video, videotapes. Oh, okay. right. Cause we had videotapes back then. We didn't, we didn't do, we didn't even do discs. Right. So you watch the videotape. And you'd, w- you'd watch the the the, the uh, episode, and you'd and I'd also cross reference that with the script, and then you'd have um, he would the 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 Goa'uld would say something, and then something would happen, right? And you'd uh, you'd have to surmise what he had said, right? And so, like there was one time I remember specifically thinking of it, where there were innocent people being held. And they were and the and the and the, and the uh, Jaffa were pointing uh, their uh, weapons at them, and Apophis said something, right? Something in in Goa'uld, and they they went they went to shoot uh, the 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 helpless uh, prisoners, and they were momentarily distracted, and then he and then Apophis said something else, and. I was like, well, he must have said kill them, like to execute them, right? Heck. And and then and then right, of course. And then he said something else again. And I was like, well, what could he possibly have said that's worse than kill them? <laughs> kill them more? Right. So I, I had I had a little bit of a problem trying to figure out what would what would be after kill them, right? And then Keck, of course, uh found its way into uh um the Unas language, right? Which was uh, Akeka, right? Akeka. So Akeka, that, that got shortened to Kek, right? But so so because I thought for sure that they would be influenced uh, by 
over over the millennia, they would be influenced by the the UNAS, right? The stuff and behind so that, the scenes that I, you guys did. I tried to connect those. You know, you know it, 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 we can only we can only scratch the surface with so much of it. But I mean, the the work that you put in to make it as authentic as possible um, is staggering. You know, and it's it's a it's a testament to to all of you that it ran for 364 episodes. So something was working, I must say. You know, it was really well done. I just disappointed cool. that uh, Atlantis and Universe ended when they did. But you know what? So am I. I was uh, I was I was quite upset. I was uh, I was not more upset than than Brad because that was his and Brad and, and Robert because that was their baby. But because they had yeah. created it from from scratch. But I was pretty. I was I was like, oh man, that's uh, that's the end of a of a of an era. That's the end of a decade of of my life and all of those wonderful creative people that I've been so fortunate to be able to work with and then for some you know it, no matter how hard you work eventually all shows get canceled sometimes you you can walk away like Seinfeld gets to walk away from a show right and uh, uh, you know but there are there are certain travesties that happen like like um, in the canceling of Firefly that's a great example mm. of, of a wonderful show that that just 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 through crappy timing and and, and bad decision making they they uh, they ended that amazing show right and i and i always think it, it sometimes it's just out of your control no, no matter how hard you work no matter how good the show ultimately is if you're up against uh i think i think um i think in the case of of a uh, firefly they were on a friday night uh, they mm -hmm. were up against, uh, you know, that was the death knell, right? That was the death time slot. And they just couldn't, it didn't matter how good the show was. And of course, everybody knows how good Firefly is. That total, that show totally didn't deserve that the, the treatment that it got or how it got canceled. Well, let's not forget so, Sequest, you know? I mean, Sequest had, yeah. in my opinion, had really found its legs in season three. Sequest. Finding the legs of Sequest. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> yes, descent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and if yeah, you're so gonna go do that, hang on just a second. What are you get? Oh, you're getting your stuff. I'm getting my stuff too. On the top of you're my bookshelf. My sorry, stuff. everybody. Yeah, sorry. We're going. We're collecting our stuff. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> Like that? That is fantastic. <laughs> wow, look at that. Yeah, me, that is great. So this is and the Gelf makeup yeah, this and everything. Is me. Yeah, I'm just gonna get that out of there. There you go. Okay. Gotta take care of him. Wow. Yeah, so this is this was to make sure that all, the, the the modeling, all the different skin tones were always in the same exact spot. Yeah. So this was the this was the reference, the uh, the key, rather, right? How long would it take every morning to, to spray paint you up? Uh, it would take between an hour to an hour and a half, at least. Well, first, there was the, the shaving. Yes. To get it down to the nub. And then the, the hour and a half. So it was, it was uh, PAX, PAX uh, makeup with um, medical adhesive. You know, that the stuff that the... the the biodegradable adhesive that, that they use to like to to um, stick colostomy bags to yeah. your body and not stuff personally, like but yes. Well, if you did, let me tell you, you don't know what you're missing, buddy. <laughs> you got to try that at least once. Yeah. So I had this but, on the top of my bookshelf. Well, yeah, show me. This is my baby. So love it, living skin. Yes, Sequest. yes, it. the bio skin. Absolutely. The bio skin. I loved that design. Always loved the ship. So that, yeah, that show, that they put some cool. money into that thing. Some say too much. <laughs> so it was a very expensive show. It was it was the most expensive show on the air for its time. Yeah. And I, I think um even even for Today's dollars, the the the, the fee, the the amount per episode was was mm -hmm. shocking. Yeah. I have to say, and I've never talked to you about this before. Uh, when the news of Jonathan's passing came about, I was devastated. 
that was that was so hard. It's just yes, that was. I was. Um, I always thought. I always thought that Jonathan was was uh, an amazing uh, actor. So talented. And very very smart for his age. I had spoken to him uh, two weeks before he died. And he had, he had just uh, made a short called the Gainesville uh, Brothers. The Gainesville Boys or the Gainesville Brothers. And it was about two brothers who, uh, during the Civil War, when it first breaks out, and one of them decides they, they're going to go with the North and one of them is going to go to the South. And it was just took place in this, this house, this farmhouse that mm-hmm. they lived in. And it, it, was his, it was his little uh, go at, at, at directing. And I was so impressed with with his ability to have put this project together and found um, these actors and designed these shots. And I was on the phone and I was just pouring my heart out because I was like, dude, you're a director, you're a filmmaker. Yeah. And that and that was that was two weeks before he died. And I was I was like, uh, I don't yeah. I don't understand. I don't understand what happened. Some people are hurting and, you know, you never, you never know. I I didn't know. I didn't know. And I felt, I felt like, was I not listening enough or, you know, I I didn't know he was in pain. I didn't know that that's where his head was at. And I, I, uh, I always think about that. Never take for granted your exchanges with anybody, even you, even you, David. Absolutely. Yes, sir. This is, we're going to have some quality time now. You and I, right I now. really, it really means so much to me to have you on. Um, you are one of, I mean, yes, it was, it's Brad and Jonathan and Rob's baby. Largely the show can be attributed to them. Your uh, component in this cannot be understated. But before we get to that, I'd like to establish a little bit of, of background um, if you could tell us a little bit about where you're from, who you were as a young person, and uh, how you really got launched into this uh, industry, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. So my, I was, um, I'm the eldest son of, of Dom DeLuise and Carol uh, DeLuise, professional name Carol Arthur. I was uh, born a poor black child, to quote the jerk. Uh, and but when my mother took one look at me, I don't think she thought I was very attractive. She took one uh, um, uh, look at me, and when it came to breastfeeding, she said, let's just be friends. <laughs> so I was, oh, okay, that's Jeez. what it's going to be. So, uh, no, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fast forward to the part where when I was a little kid, I thought, everybody worked on television and were actors because I couldn't imagine a, a, a better way to, to, to exist. Right. I didn't understand why anybody would want to, you know, cause of my naivete, I didn't understand why anybody would want to collect garbage per se, or uh, dig a ditch. So that was your world. So I just, Those are the people you're surrounded by. Yeah. So my, my dad would go out the front door and then his face would appear on the television and like if he was going out to do Johnny Carson, I would go. And this is, he actually told me this story. He said, when you're a little kid, you went, you, when you go out there, you're, you're going there to the TV. He went, yes, yes, that's what I do. <laughs> he was so proud of me. And uh, my mother and my father both did musical uh, theater when I was young. And uh, Greg Garrison from the uh, uh, Dean Martin uh, show, um, discovered my father uh, on uh, doing uh, musical theater and, and on, on Broadway and off Broadway and recruited him to do sketch uh, comedy on the Dean Martin show. And then slowly that grew into such a huge um, reoccurring uh, job that, that, that my father moved us out from New York to Corsica. Uh, not Corsica. So, so um, I mean, it, to, to uh, Los Angeles is mm. what I'm going to say. Uh, we're Italian. Um, and, and, um, we still live in the same house that we, that we, that my dad first moved us out to. And the whole time when I was coming up, I was like, my dad would 
bring us to the set and we would hang out in the wings or we would be an extra or, or something like that. And uh, my dad put us in uh, movies, uh, gave us bit parts um, and slowly but surely, you know, he didn't want to force us into it, but he also, he also didn't want to rush, rush us. When we, when we started to express interest, he didn't want to rush us into it either. So, um, didn't want to kill it for you. It wasn't until we were of age that we got uh, agents and then started to audition like like uh, regular people. And then and then we were beyond his ability to to give us work at that point. And then so if we couldn't if we couldn't deliver, we, we weren't going to get the get the part. Uh, whereas before we had. He would just make sure that we didn't suck. Right. <laughs> when we were in the things. <laughs> But then, then it became, then it, as, as each one of us came to age, my, you know, my, both of my brothers did uh, just a huge amount of, of uh, uh, series. My brother, Michael did, you know, one sitcom after another. Um, my brother, David ended up uh, doing a, a fair amount of work and then ultimately ended up uh, doing Wizards of Waverly Place. Mm-hmm. Uh, he played the dad on that, but he, he was a Disney dad on that. And then he was able to parlay that into a, you know, a ton of work because he's a very, um, you know, I guess gregarious is the right word. You know, yes, a fun, it is. Uh, and and it, and there's a cross a crossover. Uh, oh, you interviewed him. You know him. You know him better than I do. He's my <laughs> brother. Oh come on, <laughs> yeah. David's a good guy. Um, isn't he though? And he's so funny and, yeah. and lighthearted. It's hard. It's hard not to, when he starts laughing. It's hard to not laugh. In fact, you can try it, but you will fail. I agree. <laughs> Um, and then so um, pretty early on, after a, after a handful of projects, I ended up auditioning for a thing called 21 Jump Street. And I got that role uh, on, on 21 Jump Street. And, and that shot up here in Vancouver, where I am now. That's where I'm uh, doing my part of this broadcast. Where are you, by the way? Phoenix, Arizona. Awesome. Is it warm there? Uh, it was 95 yesterday. It's not the heat, it's the humidity, am I right? Uh, well, I used to say that, but when you lose an AC like I did last year and $14,000 later, oh, but that's beside the you point. You don't want to lose AC. This no. is how you know it's humid. If you first go out, if you go out outdoors and then the first instinct is to drop your drop your bag, then you know <laughs> it's, too hot, it's too humid out, right? This is true. But if you don't do the if you don't do the tea dip, right? The tea bag, then you're like, "Ah, it's dry. It's good." Well, What'd you learn on Twenty One Jump Street? What did that teach you? Well, you're getting me back on track. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so so um, while I was in the Twenty One Jump Street, I, I I was I was very keen to start to direct and have more more of a say in the finished product, and so I uh, I was able to finally, after a few seasons, get them to agree to. Um, allow me to direct and 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 I ended up directing three of those episodes and then two of the producers from that show John Smith and uh, Jonathan Glasner okay uh, ended up ended up much later in my life go, going on to a show called Stargate so I went off and I did Sequest and I directed other things and it, I came up here I came to Vancouver to uh, after the pilot season to try to uh, get some a guest work and John Smith, who was working on a series called Two T W O about the twins, um, pulled me aside after I had auditioned for him, and he said, "If you had, um, if you were um, a, a resident of Canada, if you were, if you qualified for Canadian content, I could hire you as a director because I had a very good experience with you on, on uh, Twenty One Jump Street." And so I, I made it, it took me a while, but I, I finally uh, established residence up here in Canada, became Canadian. I, I am a full blown, uh, not just a resident, but a, but a um, citizen, a, a citizen. Thank you. And, um, and, and when the Canadians speak, I understand every word they say, every single one. <laughs> it's one of us. And, and, uh, yeah, he. Uh, the, I called him and I said, I'm, "I've got, got my landed immigrant status. I'm, I, I qualify for Canadian content." And he said, "This was after about two years of, of paperwork, and I finally got around to it." And I couldn't just call it in. I couldn't just be 
a resident and not be physically here. I had to physically establish residency. So I was physically here. I, I had gotten myself an apartment. I got uh, all my paperwork done and I was so excited. I was going to maybe direct. Um, and I called John Smith up and he said, yeah, all the slots are full on, on Stargate. This was during the, uh, right at the beginning of the second season. Yeah. And then I was like, Oh, dang. And I was super disappointed. And he said, but if anybody falls out, you'll be the first alternate. And I went, Oh, which sounded like, you know, like he was putting me off. Right. Like he was just like, yeah, we'll see. And Cause I was like, no one's going to pull out. No one's going to go away and, and I'm going to be put in. And as it turned out, Mario as a party who had been a huge part of the, the first two seasons mm -hmm. got, uh, got a, uh, an assignment where I think he was doing a, a movie of the week. He had a conflict with a movie of the week. So he had to pull out and sure enough, uh, true to his word, uh, John Smith uh, plugged me in and I did uh, that first uh, episode, uh, Serpent Song. That's right. Towards the end of the end of the second season. And I must have, I must have been pressed or, or not pissed off. You, you choose uh, the powers that be. And I, I think they had a, a special little discussion on the side. You know, do you like Peter? Are, are you okay with him? You know, like Richard Dean Anderson. And of course, and I think they had to have been consulted. And, uh, you know, I don't know what he said. I can't quote him verbatim, but, you know, he may, maybe he said, yeah, he doesn't suck. Let's, let's use him again. So then I ended up doing, um, what was it? Show and tell. Right? Correct. So those are the two, the, the first two uh, episodes that I did on, on season two for, for them. And then they just kept hiring, they just kept having me back. And then I, I, uh, I was super keen to not, not only just direct, because I was so stimulated with and, and, the, and the visual effects and, the, and, the, and working with these actors and having all this all these resources, right? Because I had worked on some really low budget stuff where, you know, pretty much everything you came up with was, we can't do that. We don't have enough money for that. You know, we're, we're not, we can't do that. So this was really refreshing to be able to say, well, what if we tried this? And they're like, yeah, we could totally do that. And uh, I ended up, I ended up um, directing a show called demons which made me really think about and because i had watched all the episodes to that date the stack of, of cassette tapes remember mm. i told you the cassette cassette tapes that i had seen i had seen the the one with the with the uh, the unas in it but i think they had james earl jones as voice the voice guy. yes thor's hammer. yeah he was that was that was so that great was really right cool much yeah. like your and the, and the sound the sound um uh, design was so great too right well uh, remind me about the sound design because there's a there's a story there's a punchline to that story sure. as well um so they had real animals and uh, uh, like, this is so cool and then we had the unas on demons he would come and collect you know potential hosts right and he would take them away and i said to Brad, I said, "Hey, why don't we investigate? Like that that Unas has a Goa'uld symbiote in its head, and that's what's causing him to 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 interact like a like a thinking, a relatively thinking instead of a a, a, a primordial or a, or a primitive being. Why don't we talk about the planet where the Goa'uld and the Unas first uh, came together?" And wouldn't that be great? Because then we'd have all this great history. And and Brad, I think, saw how keen I was and how excited I was. And he was like, yeah, okay, uh, I will let you write that. And after a couple of false starts, he, you know, he sent me on the on the right path. And I ended up writing uh, the, the the first ones uh, for for uh, him. And then uh, and that was, of course, that was uh, with Dion Johnstone played Chaka, Amazing whose namesake was for, for the the land of the lost. If you're familiar with Chaka, right? Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Dion, Dion Johnson was just so great. I, I love that guy. And then the biggest, the biggest thing on the, on the design of the, of the, cause he was supposed to be a juvenile. Correct. He was doing walkabout. He was doing walkabout and, and he was just coming up. So he had to be underdeveloped. He had, couldn't have the, the major chain horns and the, so we had to differentiate between him and the, and the other older ones. And, uh, 
I, I was like, you got to make him, you got to make his costume so he can pee. And they're like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, he's got those big rubber things on. And then like, you, if he can't get to his junk, you got it. And they were like, what? Were like, okay. So like, if you pulled up his thing, you would see that there was a big zipper where his junk was and a chain with a huge ring. I don't have a ring. It was a huge ring like this, right? So he could put his giant rubber claw and pull the thing down so he could get to his junk so he could pee. That's the kind of stuff you have to think of, right? Yeah, when you're because no, like, yeah. And and they're like, oh, okay, we'll do that. So now I'm gonna finish that other story about the oh. <laughs> if you remember was it enemy mine. Enemy mm-hmm. mine, where I had yes, with Lou multiple Unas. Oh, oh, the move the, the TV episode, yes. You're not wrong. Lugas, it was in the feature film, right. Enemy Mine. And I, I I, stole the title because M-I-N-E is a mine like mine shaft, right? Or Correct. Mine enemy and also mine because they were digging and it was archaeology was in there. And my actors, all my actors who were, who were playing Unas would go, <laughs> which is a human way of, of expressing yourself, right? But you had to make the vocal cords strain and go. And I foolishly uh, just assumed they would go back like they did with the Lou Gossett Jr. Unas and go. Oh, the James Earl Jones in us. Yeah. James Earl Jones had, but his character had lion growling and, and, and bear growls and low and, and the sound design was great right okay but then my my episode came out and i had like five that i i, I did a, a, a you know a crowd duplication shot where i had hundreds of them yes. but if whenever they like alan when alex zahara as iron shirt would would express himself and he go Allah! it would just flange his voice so it sounded like a human being with a with a with a crappy filter on it i was like Oh no! Why did why did you put the cool animal growl like you did with the James Earl Jones guys? Oh, how did this happen? And that then the reason it happened is because once you directed it, all you did was turn in your cut and you'd move on to the next thing, right? You wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to supervise anything that had to do with post production sound. Wasn't right? Sharp Sound like, doing post production on Stargate? Yes, but it had been many years in between, and so uh, nobody was able to carry that ball forward. Oh say, no! This is this guy's these these beings are supposed to be have growls that are akin to animals, right? Mm. Like when Chewbacca growls, it's a it's a it's a sea lion and a and a and a and a bear and a and you know it's several different <laughs> all different pretty, thing, that's right? Pretty good. So, so I was like, oh, darn, that was a missed opportunity because that and then so the, the conceit was. It was only flanged. They only just flanged a human voice because there was no go in the, the host body at the time. And that's why the growl is different. And I was like, OK, could have been cooler, though. <laughs> you know, sounds count, too. So, so I was a little bit disappointed. I know I'm going all over the place with that, but I, I remember thinking how cool the 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 Thor's hammer version was and that that coupled with demons inspired me to want mm. to write for the for the unas and then coming up with an unas language and i was like let's do that let's let's really investigate that, that those beings and you know and it, it, we could have sympathy for our enemy which was a, another great i always loved that when you're able to to like oh they're horrible they're 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 killing us uh, indiscriminately and then you realize well it's not them it's the global controlling your bodies. They're they're not, they're actually not that. They got their own uh, problems to worry about. Well, it's one of the great then, sci-fi tropes, you know, all the way back to like the Horda and Devil in the Dark and the original Trek. You know, sympathy for your enemy is one of those great things that, you know, the the, the desire, the willingness to understand another form of life or another another person, as sure. it were, which is what it's trying to get to. That's that's corner. Even, that's cornerstone sci-fi. Well, to, to that. To that end, David, that's why it was so so ingenious to have Worf be part of the the, the regular crew, right? That's right. So we're getting like, over wow, certain man. issues, yeah. Yeah, it's like we're past that now. We're on to the next thing, and yeah. Worf is a is a viable 
complement to this crew. So let's include him, right? Which is absolutely not unlike what you what. That's why you would want someone like uh, Teal on 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 that makes sense too right that, that you have your enemy enemy amongst your your you know if you have a turncoat from your enemy be, your enemy of your enemy becomes your friend that was slightly different than the dagwood character that i played although he was other he was alien ish he was uh, a child his, his mentality was childlike whereas teal was an old soul he was he was you know he's over 100 years old right, right? But it's interesting. Yeah, you put so that, him in situations on Earth, and he would he would have a very childlike perception of the world. I was I think there's there's a reason where he was occasionally paired with children. Teal. Yeah, Teal himself, because I mean the scenes with Colleen Renison, for instance, in Bane. You know, I mean there there is a childlike nature to him. Teal and Dagwood are very similar in terms. I mean they're both genetically modified. They're both a warrior cast, even though Dagwood was the prototype. You know, uh, there's there's a great deal of similarity between those two those two beings. I agree. There there is quite a lot. There there are similarities, uh, but the difference, I guess, in my mind, the difference. What what you're pointing out is being naive to social norms of Earth is what I'm what I'm right. That's my takeaway. From okay. That. So so if. If you take that out of the equation, Dagwood was only uh, he was he, he had accelerated growth. He didn't he, he didn't he wasn't as old as he looked like he was. And he mm. had very little information about how the outside world worked. Uh, and his experience interacting with with anybody was limited, mm. whereas Teal had That's been the, the prime, the, the first prime of, of, of Apophis for, you know, arguably uh, at least a human, uh, a human Earth human's lifetime. Yeah, right? and he was a hundred at the start of the at. show. So yeah, yes, right. But he looked good. He sure I did. I look half as good when I'm on. <laughs> and he still looks good. <laughs> he sure does. He's a sexy beast. <laughs> oh my gosh! I want to jump ahead a little bit, if I may, to jump jump away. Ergo. So mm-hmm. did. You, um, where are you going? Are you looking at me, bum? Uh, me bum maybe just a little bit. Cheeky bum lookers. Yes. Yeah, so there's. Ah, uh, there's the card. Absolutely. Bubba. Yeah. Uh, there you go. There you go. What yeah, an awesome. So, so my dad was. They approached me uh, to have my dad on the show, and they said, uh, I think Tor Alexander was the – he had the seed of the idea, and he pitched that to Brad, and then Brad and Tor both approached me. And I was like I, – I was in the principal's office, and they, they said, what do you think if – and I was like, oh, what's going to happen now if we had your dad on the show? What, you want my dad? On this show, the show with the guns and the lasers and the <laughs> what? What? How does that work? And then they explained to me that he would be an amalgamation of all their their inner their the id the inner child. And I was like, oh my dad could totally do that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, let me call him. And um, we called him, and he he uh, he was he was super excited about the idea that, that he would get to get to work. He loved, my dad loved to work on anything. You know, he was a, he, he much preferred to work than, than, than not to work. And uh, he was still quite mobile uh, then, mm. not totally, but still uh, enough. And um, I said, uh, when we were prepping the show, I said, it's very important uh, that my dad have a, a proper chair to sit in. And they were like, what are you talking about? My dad needs a proper sturdy chair to sit in on the set so because because then then we'll get his best if you he can't sit in a regular director's chair and and uh, he can't be in an uncomfortable little folding chair so you, you got to give him a proper chair and they sent away and got me this really scoop him i know i'm talking about a chair on a sci-fi show but i have to tell you this chair, this beautiful chair, tons of padding, very sturdy. It was like a throne, right? Ah. And 
that, even though it sounds dumb, it put my dad at ease and, and it comforted him. And he could, we, all he had to do was just, he could sit right friggin' there, right? Right off, off camera and then stand up and then be alive and do whatever he needed to do. And then w- when we weren't shooting, he could just walk one, two, three, point and just sit down, which is exactly what he needed, right? To, to give us a hundred percent. And it, it was exhausting, the, the kind of stuff that he was ha- having to put through, put out, put out that energy. He runs and that show. Sh- I would, sh- yeah, I would. I was shooting two shots of him. Like I would shoot his coverage, and then I would also keep his shot alive with another two shot while I was shooting the other coverage because I whatever he was willing to give us, I was I wanted uh, to get right. And he came up with so many fun, uh, fun lines that we had so much extra material. We had multiple. I don't know if you realize this, but uh, you know the Judd Apatow and stuff. He, when he makes his movies, he throws in uh, uh, couplets. He would like, say, "Try this joke. Try this joke. Try this joke." Uh, Steve Carell, same thing. They yeah. they try jokes on the fly. So that's kind of what was happening. Was he would try this joke and he try that joke, and then so you know Chris Judge or Terrell Rathery never knew what he was gonna say for sure, <laughs> and then they would laugh. Like, ah, come on, stop don't laughing. laugh. Bite your cheek. <laughs> right. And then God bless uh, Brad Wright. He went through all of the material, all of the alternate takes, all of the lo- the one lines, and he crafted, because I couldn't do it. I mean, all I could do was give him what he wrote and, you know, a couple of zingers. But Brad went deep, deep in, and he got all the fun stuff, and he brought that forward. And he what Brad ultimately cut together was just chef kiss, double, double chef kiss, Right. And, and that experience, I treasure that for the rest of my life. I'll never forget it. I got to work with my dad. We all got to work with my dad, but I got to work with my dad. And I got to say, anytime, Pop, go for it. And he came up with such joyful, joyful things. And people still quote, you know, I, you know, I want to experience life. I want to eat pie, right? I want to eat pie. And um, how can you resist this, right? That was his line. Yeah, <laughs> no, that was uh, your line that he dubbed. Can you resist? Well, he this? said he performed. It's funny. He performed it. And then I, I assumed the same position and I tried to imitate <laughs> him. Exactly. But I, you know, I, I did the best I could, but he was, he was determined to have me be the, the younger, nicer version of himself. <laughs> and I'm like, but dad, there's way more handsome people here. We could get in. He goes, I want you to do it. I was like, okay, all right. It's all good. You were already doing cameos at that point anyway. So it wasn't, you know, it, it fit. It worked. Yes. It, it did fit. It was. It made sense to for having, for me to be in there. Yeah. So that was a joyful moment, a high point for me on that show, and I will I will cherish it. Yeah. Did you ever think you'd direct him? Um, I had directed him before. Okay. On on other things, but not not to that degree. Not not to that level. Uh, and and we had worked uh, together on on uh, Sequest by that point. All the That's brothers. That's correct. We'd also done. We did. We ended up doing the Third Rock from the Sun as well as as a group, and um, so we there was a couple and Hot Stuff when we were much younger when that was a movie that he directed. We, so there was a couple of few times where we got to work with him individually and as a as as a group. Um, and so it didn't feel like it was the only time I ever got to work with him, but it was definitely one of the most special times I got to work with him. Wow. Um. Serpent Song is so back to that for a moment. It's your first directorial My first uh, shot. That's right. Right. So that was originally Mario as a party. And then that went to you. Yeah. Okay. So that was that's Apophis. Apophis is trying to get away. And we find out. So we've got a major crash, uh, a crash in the in the desert. And then we've also got where we start to see Peter Williams as Apophis, and we see him, once the Goa'uld sort of goes into a coma, we see the host body, uh, what what the host body is, is experiencing, which is really uh, interesting because that, that was a great way to help us clarify what was happening and who, who was who, and, uh, and, and to, uh, again, give us sympathy for your en- enemy, right? That's right. Uh, yeah. That's and wh- Peter Williams was so great at that, uh, in that part, you know, speaking the ancient Egyptian and not understanding what, 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 what was happening. And I just thought that was, he was quite good at that. And then, and then 
and and all all of that came about the Gulawuld and the fact that the host bodies and the and the conceit of how it works. The bad guys are are hiding in our. I mean, it's as a sci-fi conceit, it's been around for a while. We've got you've got puppet masters and and, and various things like that. Like and, and you've got uh, um, what's the one with Donald Sutherland with the uh, the uh, the uh, the attack of the the plant people. What's oh, that? the um. Oh, for crying out loud! Uh, the pod people, yeah, it's uh, yeah. I know, you know, I'm, yeah. Yes, so it'll come to me. There, there's throughout history, there's been a sci-fi conceit that you, you know, the aliens are amongst us, right? And, and invasion even of the body snatchers. That, invasion of the body snatchers. And then the, there was a, the the other one, that wonderful one they called the uh, who's the dude from Twin Peaks. Uh, um, oh. Haven't seen it. Uh, Kyle, Lyle, Kyle, Kyle. And then the, remember the thing went into his mouth and it would take over your body and he was trying to find it would go from person to person. Yes. Now I can't remember. So it wasn't new, <laughs> right. but the, the, to Dean Devlin's credit, once once he realized that Jay Davidson's character wasn't that scary and they're like, he's just the dude, right? And he was, he was supposed to be the, the front guy, right? Uh, he was supposed to be the front man for the aliens. And then I think Dean Devlin said, we don't have much of a bad guy here. We got to figure this out. Let's add glowing eyes, a flanged voice. And then when he dies, this is the part we, we conveniently forgot about. Mm-hmm. Once he got blown up, you saw this weird looking. Uh, m- m- Almost Michelin Asgard. Man looking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a white-headed, weird-looking thing, and you were like, "I don't. We'll just ignore that part, but all the other stuff we'll take." And and so the idea, to Dean Devlin's credit, was to, as, what a great way to fix it in post, right? We, we, so Brad Wright and I guess Jonathan Glasner ran with that because that was now that was canon. That was part of the show. Is you never know if you're talking to a regular person who's pretending to be that person. Because you get a, you get us you get their their memories as well. That was right. also a conceit was that the gold would go in there, tap into your brain, bore into your brain, and then get access to some of your memories so they could kind of fake it, fake that they were that person, right? And then so what's nice about that is, and the same thing with Battlestar Galactica in the in the in the recreation, right? Was you never knew if you were dealing with the enemy or your friend, right? And I thought that that was a great and also it's it's um it makes your enemy more relatable, but it also makes it cheaper. It's like having an invisible enemy, right? If you if your enemies can be de- depicted by normal looking people, then you're do- then you're right, right? And and then once in a while their eyes will glow and they'll have uh, superhuman uh, strength or and flange power. and everything else. Absolutely, yeah. it was a great um, w- one of my favorite lines uh, from this is you know when when. SG one finds out what's going to happen to Apophis if he gets returned to Sokar. Uh, uh, Martouf, played by J.R. Bourne, says, "Surely you welcome this." And the looks on everyone's yes. face is like, "No, we, well, we yeah, don't. We don't Mar- welcome it. You know, I mean, we don't want right, anyone to right. anything to suffer. You know, I love that beat." Yeah, the, the the different philosophies. Well, and of course, Martouf is he's he's a war veteran. Who's yeah, he's been at war with them for forever. thousands of years. Yeah, so of course he wants the enemy to suffer, but the but they were like, well, what about the host body of the guy? Like that's not cool. Mm-hmm. Why, why would you do that? Yeah, uh, having ha- having various shades of gray and three dimensional problems as opposed to black and white or or not black and white, but two dimensional mm. uh, problems is so much more interesting, right? When when you start talking about. Um, the, the the preciousness of, a, of of life and 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 being better than your enemy you know raise, rising to to uh, to to or, or being on the high, the higher mm-hmm. path right uh, uh, peter williams is regularly referenced by uh, uh amanda and chris and some of the others as one of the best villains the show had certainly he was the first you know he picked up what jay davidson had had introduced uh in the feature but i mean he was just a giant when he was on that screen he took over he was apophis tell us about directing peter so that that's interesting because i came in towards the end of the second season. So I, 
you know, I have, I was, I was all about playing catch up and, and right. also, you know, can, candidly and, and frankly, I will, I will tell you that, that, that I was trying to endear myself to, to whoever uh, wanted to, to possibly hire me. Right. Well, God knows so, you went through enough to get there by what you just said. So I wouldn't blame a, a fair you. Amount, yeah. So I, I watched the show all the way up until that point, and I and up until then I realized we had only ever seen him, Peter Williams going, mm, bum, bum, bum. yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and and this was the first time we were actually going to see him in a in a very vulnerable position, and so making him old and giving him cataracts eyes and having him call out those I was like that will haunt. That should, if, if people are paying attention and they're empathetic or sympathetic at all. Everyone but Teal, for sure, yeah. Yeah, that poor, that poor host body that is, that was, that's had to endure that mm. needs, you know, uh, has, it deserves your empathy. Uh, and so that was the goal, was to make sure that that happened. And of course, Peter Williams is just so, so laid back and so cool, right? Like he did. He's the opposite of what Apophis is in real life. He's like, yeah, it's all, it's all good. He's like, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all good. I can't do his accent, but you know, he had to put that rubber, old, wrinkly stuff on his face, mm. and he had to put the cataracts when he was helpless. He couldn't see, yeah. right? And he had that choke. He had that chain on. And also, we had to make him look like he was Hannibal Lecter, right? So we had to, right. we had to restrain him. And so he was completely vulnerable. If his nose itched, he was he was shit out of luck because his hands were restrained, yeah. right? And he had that rubber on his face, and he had the cataracts. And I, said, are you are you okay, man? And he'd be like, Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Can, you, can you scratch my nose? Can you scratch my nose because it itches? And I was like, Yeah. How's he goes to the left? Oh, okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, he was he he was an absolute joy. Yeah, he was lovely. That show is is definitely one of my favorites for the reasons that we mentioned. The visual effects in it are great. The performances are great. It introduces Sokar, who came back later on. David Palfi did a masterful performance as Sokar and later as Anubis. Um, yeah, so that Sokar, I had a, a fair amount of uh, of fun with that. The Sokar, um, I the wanted effect. him to look. Well, the, the his the way he looked right through the, the iris, the veininess. Or no, we're talking about okay, Jolinar's memories in the Devil You Know, season three. Because he first, we the first time we see, see him, him, he's on the iris. Yes. So by the time we see him in the flesh, he's season three. Right. So David Pelfi has an, an amazing uh, speaking voice. It's, it's like it's like melted butter on toast. Delicious. And and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I was like, we, we've got to make him look really gnarly, right? Because he's so car. Everyone's going, oh, so car, so car, so car. He, so he can't just look like a regular dude. He's got to look cool, right? And so, uh, you know, Robert Cooper, I don't know if, if you, I don't know if you've gone into this detail, is a huge fan of, of the Star Wars um, franchise. And so it, it wasn't a mistake that, that, uh, that so car was, well, he was, cowled and he was older and you're like it, it was like shades of the 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 emperor the emperor right uh, but the other part of what was what are the scariest eyes you could possibly have right and so the the veininess the pale the pallor with the veininess that that was like a little bit of a uh, uh, dune uh, coupled with, and then the eyes, if you look really closely at the eyes, the colored eyes, they're the exact color, which is the tip of the hat, to uh, Darth Maul, which I said, I was like, hey, I'm pretty sure the scariest eyes on the, ever in the history of, of, of cinema are the Darth Maul eyes. Let's do that. Let's do the Darth Maul eyes. So they was like, okay, we, we, can, we can recreate the Darth Maul eyes. So, then, so I was grabbing, because my theory was, we only have a week mm -hmm. to figure this out. And uh, George Lucas had years to develop what he thought was the scariest looking eyeball, right? Uh, for for Darth Maul, mm. and so I was like, "Well, let's let's just be inspired by that, you know. Call it homage while we're at it, you know. And then, or it could be an Easter egg. Here are the exact eyeballs that Darth Maul has. Oh, I didn't know that. 
That's a fun little Easter egg, right? And I, I may have even expressed that on, on the filmmaker's commentary. Have you ever watched the filmmaker's commentary? For for the Joel and memories and the devil you know? For for uh, Stargate SG-1 in general. Yes. Yeah, when they came out on oh, the DVDs, I, w- I listened to them all. So it's been a long time. But yeah, they were great. Yeah, so in in while I was doing... In between scatological humor between myself and, and Gary Jones and Dan Shea, I would occasionally put in an Easter egg like, these are Darth Maul eyes. Yeah. And then I'd go back to the, the toilet humor. <laughs> and it was the only Goa Wood whose eyes glowed red when his eyes would glow. So he had obviously figured out some nope, kind of special I, I concoction. Had forgotten, I had forgotten that. I, I didn't put that on my cheat sheet. So thank you for <laughs> That's awesome. No. While we're on the subject of villains, we recently lost Cliff Simon. Um, do you have any words for yeah. Cliff? Uh, I, 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 I really, 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 really liked Cliff. I told I told you Peter Williams was pretty laid back. Cliff was also incredible, just a just a, a absolute joy to work with. He wore uncomfortable clothing. He was very accessible. He had to do multiple, like there was that the, the one where he was multiple uh, versions of himself, which is very yes. time consuming and can get in, uncomfortable. I went on a convention to Germany uh, with him and we hit it off. We, we were just, we, we were just, like, like I didn't know him outside the show, mm. but because we had worked together and because he was so laid back, he was like, yeah, it's good. I think we were trying to, we were trying to raise money for charity, a local charity there. And, and you know, the, after a while you're like, I'm running out of stuff. I don't know what to <laughs> auction now. Right? right. And so I was like, Hey Cliff, what do you, what do you think? Do you want to, do you want to do like a, a body shot or something. And he, <laughs> uh, and he goes, Oh yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so we auctioned up a body shot. He, where he, you, he, he put, uh, cause he had ripped abs and he was, I mean, he was an Adonis, right? He was just <laughs> so in shape. And I, I think he put salt and lemon on his, on his belly. And, and he put the, or I, I think he put a, a shot here and a, and a, a lime and, it, and, and, you know, the fans absolutely went wild and they, and they, and they, they raised, you know, a fair amount of money for the opportunity to lick salt off of his belly, do a, a, a shot and then, and then get the line from his lip. And he was all over it. He was like, yeah, no problem. It's like, I love this guy. <laughs> so, I mean, I wanted to tell a joyful story about him, but because, because I have, I never saw him lose his temper or, or get uh, pissy. I just thought he was just, just wonderful. And I, and I I really enjoyed working. With him. I didn't get to work with him as much as Martin Wood did, mm. but uh, I I really thought he was amazing. And, and Andy Makita I think worked with him quite a lot. Of, but I mean, so I, I I rarely got the ball episodes, the the the, the character that he played. There ball. was ball the ball the ball episode. There was one story that he told me, and uh, it was. And I hope you'll forgive this. It was it was a disagreement about I, I'm pretty sure it was off the grid in season nine, and it's one of the many times where Ball has it has passed. In this in this case, he blows up on his mothership, and he said to me that you directed him that okay, Cliff, when when this thing goes, I want you to scream. I'm interested to see if you remember this. And Cliff was like, Peter, there's no way Ball is going to scream. In this situation, when the things blows up, I, d- I don't think I can, I don't think the character would do that. And and you were like, according to him, he's like, wait, you're not going to scream? He was like, I, I don't think I can. <laughs> it just doesn't fit for the character, you know? And, and to, to me, this says, this is an actor who really feels that he knows that role and knows what that character would or wouldn't do. Yeah. Well, that sounds like something that I would ask him to do. And if he didn't feel it was right, then the you know he can make his case, or he could make his case back then. Um, I that sounds like something that did actually happen. Like I I I, I don't remember that; it's mm. not fresh in my mind. But for me, um, 
yeah, I, I'm sure I, I was going for the 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 the, the, sh- the the more shallow, more melodramatic version of "Oh my God, I'm gonna die!" Right, <laughs> right. And uh, and I'm, I'm I think what 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 happens is you get caught into this this thing where and and I've I've seen other uh, people talk about this on the show where they go, "This is the most amazing thing you've ever seen on the green screen," and the actors go, "Right." Well. Uh, what and I've I've heard you talk about this and you're like can you can you be uh, just a little bit awe inspired? I go well I've already seen ships and stuff blow up and so how am I supposed to get excited? I was like well now we have a problem uh, um, and th- this has nothing to do with Cliff mm. although uh, kudos kudos to Cliff for standing up for his character and he's right I mean if he's one of hundreds of versions of himself even though I think clones want to survive ultimately. Um, that um, if he wants to die, if he wants to die in a dignified way, <laughs> it's hard for me as a filmmaker whose who, who job is to be, to be visceral and to get the audience super excited about it. Yeah. Or if if you know, and all, all I can do after if you like you don't want to scream, what am I going to do? I'll just go. Uh oh, right. So, right. so I mean, <laughs> what can I do? Well, I'm about to die. I'm about to be engulfed in a fiery ball. Ball. And it, uh, here comes the fiery ball. I mean, <laughs> then, then I get called into the how come room. Oh, yeah. You said you hate the how come room. They, after they all watch the dailies, you know, in between burping and slurping while they're watching uh, uh, during lunch, you know, watch the dailies, you get called them. How come you didn't have Cliff Simon do a big reaction? <laughs> He wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't scream. He didn't feel that it was right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, he's right. You wouldn't scream. You're, you're a combatant. You're a military, you're dignified. But. And suave. He was more, yes. So suave. Right. Um, he, He was more sophisticated than I was. And he knew more about his character. And I, I'm glad he stood up for himself. And I'm glad I lost that, that, uh, that, that I'm glad he didn't scream. I mean, but can you imagine, I mean, there, I mean, there's been other, um, there's a bunch of Star Trek deaths where the, where the ship blows up and stuff right. like that, where they, uh, right. Right. And then boom. And, it, and it, it's, it's just more satisfying than people, somebody going, oh, I'm about to die. Exactly. <laughs> We we interviewed you during so, production of season nine, and I'll never forget this. It's just one of those things that like stuck in the back you of my brain. Me during season nine, right? Yeah, Ben and Claudia were with you at that point. It was just before. It was like around nine nine oh five nine oh six, and we were getting excited about the new season. You guys were hinting at the stuff that was coming, and for whatever reason, this has always stuck with me. You said, "Ball is back." And his collars are taller and pointier than ever. <laughs> I just thought, well, like, would... that is perfect. Well, they well they were they were quite pointy, right? <laughs> they were like, and he would go exactly right. He couldn't he couldn't go like that. He couldn't turn his head like that because he'd get a bunch of collar in his face. Like, what, what's happening? I'll have to turn like this. Yeah. He yeah he had some awesome collars. But I mean, to me, that was the thing. If you if you're watching with the sound off, that's what you would notice first, and then you'd go, "Oh my God, he's the most gorgeous man on the planet." In South Africa, and he's got high collar. Absolutely. Show and tell, season two of SG One. Much of this episode yes. hangs on the performance of young Jeff Golka, and this Charlie, is the guy who plays little Charlie. That's yeah. exactly right, Charlie. And it's a it's a heavy visual effects episode where we're we're going after an enemy that's not there. Carmen Argenziano's in this one. Uh, th- this is this is I think it's arguably a bottle show. I suppose you could call it that because it's mostly pretty much all at the base because it all takes place in the base yeah. pretty much except for one off world uh, shot where you know we go and see this huge field of nothing and then they point oh, their little the, thing the with the ter. Yeah. Look, looking down, looking down at the the, the valley of the lobsters. Yes, the valley of lobsters. That's about right. Any memories from show and tell? 
Another one we uh, lost, Carmine I remember, Giziano. I remember working with, with uh, uh, little Charlie, mm. and uh, he was underage, so he, we had a time constraint on him, which I, I remember thinking in retrospect that that was a giant pain in the ass, having to get him out on time, you know, having to juggle all the other things and also getting him out on time was, uh, you know, I've since made friends with the idea. We, we, you know, you shoot the kid first, always, or shoot the kid out, always, and then maybe have a double if, if you need a double for a, for an over the shoulder, over the shoulder shot onto somebody else. But the, we had not planned our day in a, in a way that made that made total took advantage of, of totally of, of working with a kid. And I remember specifically thinking, Oh, I'm not going to get him out. I got to get my shots right away. <laughs> and then that was the, that was when I played the machine gun guard. I, I, I Yes, I, you did. I'm you sorry. picked around the, picked around the 50 okay? Cal. Yeah. So what, 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 one of the things that happened was I read, I was reading the script and I saw that they were all in the control room all of our core characters were in the control room and there was no speaking characters in the, the main, the, the gate room. And Charlie's character comes out, but he's just a little kid. Right. And they correctly go, Oh, but then I was like, it's going to take a while for them to come around to get all the way out from the control room, come all the way around into the gate room. And I was like, wouldn't it be funny if a dude like one of those hardcore machine gun dudes looked around and like, because I've got a giant weapon pointed at him. I'm like, is that a little kid that, that came out to the... And so I thought, wouldn't that be a le- an interesting level of intrigue if a gate guard, a machine gun guard, was like, I, I hope I'm not expected to shoot this little kid because I don't know if I can do it. And so I added that level of... I thought that would be a funny little sort of a elbow jab but also it would create time for the for the for the core actors to come around come and uh you know also i had great respect for um uh alfred hitchcock who did a lot of cameos who, who that inspired for me that's what inspired the cameos in the first place that's why i was doing because i just thought that could be fun i'll just do some cam- i'll put myself here or there i'll put myself in a in a piece of art or a or a, or a file folder or a file photo or yeah <laughs> <laughs> like the Russians, yeah. well, well, I mean, but, but but Hitchcock did all those things way before I, did, mm. you know, way before it was uh, a trendy. Like he was he was the trendsetter, right? And I was like, maybe we could do that. Maybe <laughs> I could do that a couple of times. Yeah. More than a few, and they're great because, like Hitchcock, you have no speaking lines. You know, it's just like blink and you'll miss him. You know, and it's it's uh, uh, who was it that did the pineapples? Um, Will Waring. Will Waring. That's right. Pineapple yeah. Man. You know, there's just certain things that's just like, oh, it's a Will episode. There's a pineapple. You know, this is yeah. good stuff. This is one of there the was, benefits of being a long time viewer. At Will Waring. Will Waring. I think that came from when he used to operate. Prior to that, he would uh, he would invariably not not only sneak pineapples in, but also uh, camera equipment like the the pan the pan wheel and stuff like that. That would just hide it in the background and. There was another show that was shot on the on the Bridge uh, Studios as well, um, called Outer Limits. And because it was Canadian, and this was the Canadian uh, incarnation of it, they would hide a hockey puck uh, in, <laughs> in various shots. And so every once in a while, if you for the keen-eyed viewers of of the uh, second generation uh, Outer Limits, you would see a hockey puck, and you go, "Why, why is there a hockey puck there?" And then I remember uh, vividly this wonderful story about the, the line producer coming out and screaming at the crew, there's no justification for a hockey puck to be on a buffet table. Now stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and I always said that that was quite, quite funny. I was like, yeah, you take your chances. You put the hockey puck wherever you can. That's Another great. excellent series. Brad and Jonathan were involved in that one too. I think for the first three seasons of SG1, they were also co-producing Outer Limits. So they had their plates full. Yeah, yeah. So the, the the way I heard the story was they were both co-writing, producing Outer Limits, and Stargate the movie came out with uh, James Spader and Kurt Russell, and they both independently recognized that that was a great, great way uh, uh, device uh, rather for a series because. Mm. 
you, there's a there's a there's a slang expression in in storytelling uh, story writing where it's called the door in what is the door into the story well the door in is quite literally a door to another planet right and you don't have to get bogged down you don't have to get bogged down with uh, it's not unlike time tunnel how t- how great time tunnel was a great idea with you could just go back in time to anywhere you wanted but um, they both independently recognized that this show which was being done by MGM would be a great vehicle for a series because you have a door in to any planet you want and you don't have to get bogged down with spaceships and space. You're just, you walk through and you're there. Right. And so it's cost, per, per, uh, it's cost. Uh, friendly. Yeah. It makes sense. It, it, it's, it's cost friendly and you can, you can invest it. Well, the, the greatest part about Star Trek was all the different cultures that you were coming up on right and so so you'd go to a different culture and you'd and you'd and you'd see you know and i know i know a lot of people made fun of the fact that there was a lot of woodland areas but we we (laughs) that's great we had to work with well we we always we always thought that you know there was a terraforming device you know like it it was uh, it was good enough for star trek it's good enough for us we have a terraforming thing we we uh, we've already explained in, in 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 stargate the movie that humanoid people have been brought to other From planets Earth. to populate them now you've got all these different cultures that were inspired by historical gods of our planet right so you've got you can just throw it that way that way that way so any era any era on earth or any uh, any any um, god mythology that you had was open game for uh for the show so any planet because if a Goa world was going to take over a planet and they had to assume a, a god like a, a, a thing to, to manipulate pe- uh, people to be slave labor, that's what that that's what mm-hmm. made sense, right? And then so you had that was the base, and then you went off in every different direction from there, right? Which it worked. Which I thought was a, a great idea. And yeah. So did a lot of fans and, for seventeen seasons. Well, that well, the other part of it, and I, I think I've heard you talk about it on other on other uh, podcasts, were that uh the 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 issue of speaking english yes came up so um and then you correctly pointed out that star trek tried to deal with that a little bit with the with the The universal translator Mm -hmm. except i mean they they never did it perfectly because the your mouth the actor's mouth is not forming a different word it's forming the exact word that you're seeing so then yet another layer of, of intrigue has to come up with there well, you're not actually seeing the mouth forming <laughs> the word that it's actually forming. That's you're true. watching the mouth form a different, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an illusion that the inner soul was like, well, how, what? And this is the other thing is, uh, 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 Jordy to bridge, right? You'd hit the thing, right? Jordy to bridge. Beep, beep, beep. You're like, does everybody hear that? Is it right. just the one guy who hears that on their show? And so there was a certain amount of conceit, like eh, we don't have to get into it. Like, and maybe the unit, maybe this thing is smart enough. It goes, oh, to bridge. You want to go to bridge, all right? So that means it's not, it's not the exact time. It has to figure out what, who you want to talk exactly. to. Exactly. There has to be a lag because for for it to go there's somewhere. A short, there's a tiny lag. So on on, uh, it's not. If you watch the first ones, you'll see that you know the the Unas are speaking. Unas, right, and and uh, and the Goa'uld have their own language, and then so did the Jaffa. They have their own language, which was in and the show was kind of based on ancient Egyptian that James Spader was able to help uh, you right. know, figure out. But almost immediately, every if you don't all speak English, almost immediately every single episode becomes nanu nanu. What do you say? Is that banana morning? What? I don't know what Bernani Bernie means. Oh, God. How much of this can we take? Bernani Bernie. Again, click. You see, now the show's off, right? Nobody right. wants to hear. What's he saying again? Let's get to the story, right? you know? Let's and get to the story. You ha- and you play with it in Wormhole Extreme, too, you know? When um, Jill Teed comes up to you guys and says, okay, I'm out of phase. Why don't I fall through the floor? And it's that great beat where everyone's like... Yeah. It's perfect. I have no answer. <laughs> well, and, and also, I mean, if you had if you had just watched, you know, a wonderful movie, uh, Ghost, right? Right. Where you everybody had watched Patrick Swayze, where the commonality was the floor, 
And so this this was fine, but you could walk through this anytime you wanted, right? You go through the door, it was fine, but nobody sank through the floor. And it was like, yeah, that's... And you, every once in a while, you get Paul Muller or, or, or Joe, uh, Paul and Joe, they go, you know, they, they never explain that. Right. right? So that so it ends up in the movie because because that's a conceit that we're all just going to the, the commonality is the floor and we're not going to we're not going to go past that. It, right? And there, if I may, like to have a quick aside, there there is a, a an app online and I can't remember what it's called. It's basically a, a choose your own adventure movie. And one of them is where, you know, people, once they die, they become ghosts and they can only stand on the physical ground. So anytime that they go into buildings, they're like here. And they can't go upstairs. Yes. And it's it's an interesting storytelling tool, but it's also very distracting. And it's like, you know what? I'm just glad for most sci-fi stuff, you just don't deal with it. Their feet, their, the bottoms of their shoes are exempt. They're able to walk wherever they do and often perch themselves yep. up in strange corners in the rooms as well. I don't know why that's a thing, but we do that too. So, you know, it's just there's well, just certain it, things that you have to do to make the story work. Well, and, and if... if, if if in the sixth sense that was the case, then M. Night Shyamalan Ding Dong would be out of luck, right? Be like, oh, that guy's totally ghost. He's up to here in his chest in the counter. I, that's a dead giveaway, right? So, so, um, when, when, the, uh, to that end, I actually had an episode where we did that, where, where, you, where uh, Ben Browder was out of phase. Correct. Carter, right? Right. And I had him fall, I had him fall into a counter. Uh, James uh, James Titchener w- w- was the supervising Visifex, vis- vis- and I had him I had him fall back and then come up. It, there was a counter right there, like a like a rolling island, like you would expect to see in a in a uh, in a kitchen mm. uh, in the lab. And I had him poke his head up through the like this, <laughs> and James Titchener went, "What are you doing?" I go, "Well, it's funny, right?" Like it looks hilarious. He's out of phase. Think, and he's like, he's out of phase all the way up to here in the thing. And he's like, okay. But he wasn't ready for that. He's like, oh, uh, I didn't, I didn't really I didn't think we were going to do that. Okay, we'll, we'll figure that out. No. Have to make it work with what you have. And then now, yeah. And come to think of it, we, we would have had to have shot a clean plate with the, with the thing rolled out of the way anyway. It may have not. I don't recall it being in the show. I don't recall it making that. Maybe, maybe they, maybe they overruled me and took it out because it was too, (laughs) too, uh, too advanced, too ahead of its time. You you have to pick your battles. You know, if it's with actors or it's with visual effects, you know, you can't die on every hill. I'm sure that's something you know that all of your directors have to realize long ahead of time. It's like what, what am I going to say? Put my foot down and say we have to make this work for the story that I want to tell. So. Yeah, there's the kiss principle. Uh, keep it simple, s- stupid. Uh, or, but the, but you but you still have to. It still has to be entertaining, right? To a certain extent. So there's a balance between. And uh, Andy Makita talked about this too. With it, once in a while you'd get a you get a script like the, all the scripts were pretty darn good. But every once in a while you'd get one that was just okay. You know, like how can I distract the audience? Because then man, now it's about execution, right? I'm going to distract the audience a little bit so that they they're they're invested in what's happening. Like how can I raise the stakes so that they're invested in what's happening and not not distracted by how simple or or transparently uh, you know uh, simple this this story is. And so you add it would add a, a layer of intrigue uh, to it you know, where what there would be a cool shot or or the, you'd show the humanity of a particular character mm-hmm. when they when they died or thought they were going to die right. Mm-hmm. And then bring it, bring bring the stakes back. Absolutely, because that was a balancing act too. Because I mean, how many times have you seen on the show where somebody was pointing a weapon at one of our core characters, and they were flipped, and you know they, they didn't, they weren't intimidated, right? And it was so a that, staple that of Rick's comedy. Absolutely right. So <laughs> they, so if you do that too much, then it's then it becomes cartoonish, where where right. the audience goes, oh, he'll be fine. It'll be great. It'll, right. It'll all work out in the end. I have fan questions for you, Peter. I like fan questions. Here we go. Gate Gabber wants to know, were you a sci-fi fan growing up? And if so, uh, which series did you like? Yes. What's what's this dude's name? Gate Gabber. It's my co-producer. Gate Gabber. Linda. Oh, I love it. What's this lady's name? Linda. Linda. 
Linda. Big shout out to Linda. Linda! Uh, Star Trek. I love Star Trek. I love Planet of the Apes. I know that's not uh, pure sci-fi, but man, I love, when I was a little kid, I just loved Planet of the Apes. And um, I loved Star Trek growing up. I, my, my dad, somehow my dad got his hands on the three quarter inch tape of the bloopers of Star Trek. And uh, we just thought that was the greatest thing wow. the, of, of the of the bloopers way back then when 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 cassette tapes were this thick and it took a while for it to spool up. Yeah, we just loved that. Um, I also loved Wild Wild West. Yeah, I thought that that was a really cool show uh, when I was and Mission Impossible. I, I was uh, quite I really liked Mission Impossible. Uh, uh, combat, uh, Vic Moreau. Um, what else did I like? Um, I watched time tunnel, but not, I mean, I only watched a few of those mm. and, Oh, oh, you know what? I love voyage to the bottom of the sea. And also I loved um, it. incredible journey. Okay. I love incredible journey so much. I used to read, uh, Heinlein books. Yeah. I, 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 I read all the Heinlein books. I thought those were pretty cool. And uh, did I answer the question? Yes, you did. It's mostly Star Trek. I watched every single Star Trek a lot. That's what I did. Yeah. Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea came on late night, I think Saturday nights. And, and I loved that show. It was Star Trek Under the Sea. Just like, you know, Sequest. It was, it was, it was the, Star Trek Under the, the Sea. Flying sub. Yeah, it totally was. Yeah, Absolutely. So those, are, those all had an influence on me for sure. Yeah. Carlos Takeshi, is there a shot or scene that you weren't able to get into one of uh, your Stargate episodes, but just really wish that you could. That's not, in, yeah, that's, there so, was a so lot Carlos, of episodes. Uh, that, yeah. There was that I had uh, created a rig uh, for warrior. With, uh, I helped, I co-created a rig uh, with Ray Douglas and his team, uh, which was called the revolver shot. Uh, camera rig where we would we would spin it around very yes. fast and we were simulating in, in a practical effect of that uh, that they had done in in, uh, in matrix right and that was our, our goal and i had hoped to do that again uh for for the shot where um where rich richard dean anderson was was going around in a circle with his machine gun Ah uh, yes, the, yeah. Remember, in uh, remember that? Yes, in Allegiance in season six with the that was Dan yeah, Payne's so first in episode. Alle That's right. So in Allegiance, I had hoped that we would use that rig as well for that, and then uh, uh, it was uh, cost prohibitive, so they they overruled me and they said no. So that's my fast, my quick answer to that was I wanted to use the Robala shot rig for that again, but it was there was a huge amount of setup and it was it was quite pricey to get that done so they they correctly overruled me and said no is that also in that scene it, i've heard maybe it's maybe it's myth but uh, that rick used basically an entire season's production budget of bullets in that in that sequence i don't doubt it uh, we used a saw right so right. i had the big the big uh, the the sea can uh you know the the hundred shot uh, can of the what the the the, the squad the, the squad weapon and as an alternative to the device that I wanted, I made, I made, I made Jim Van Dyke, who was the, the steady cam operator counter rotate. Mm. So as, as Richard Dean Anderson went around this way in slow motion with the uh, spraying the bullets, I had Jim Van Dyke go around the other way and, there was no way around it. I mean, he was using practical. Weapons. I wanted to see the the shells flying and yeah. going crazy and everything because this was the this was the absolute pinnacle of the whole episode, right? This was the big. This was Richard Dean Anderson figuring it out and making it right, you know, and and, and fixing the you know having a solution to the problem, right? Because of this invisible foe, right? Yeah, he's tired of everyone and, being killed over this thing. He's like, okay, I'm putting matters in my own hands. So so Jim Van Dyke had a plexi thing in, on his face and he had a huge body armor in front of his body, right? All the way down. And he, and he, and he had gloves on 
And Richard Dean Anderson was shooting, pop, 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 pop. And you remember the, the, the shells were rolling out and they, they counter rotated each other, which made it look pretty cool. And we were shooting at a, at a we were over cranking, which means yes. we were shooting more film, which meant that it was going to be shown in slow motion. That's when, but way back when, when we were still shooting film back then. And uh, we shot it once and it didn't go to plan. It didn't happen the way I had hoped. And so we were, there was going to be a take two. And so we, we got not a whole rotation, but part of a rotation. Either it was a gun jam or, or, or didn't, it didn't happen quite the way I had hoped. And uh, I remember looking at Jim Van Dyke, who is, you know, a real mensch. He was a, it was an awesome dude for, for doing the shot. But I'm, I, I'm sure he was like, this doesn't seem safe. You're spraying bullets across my body, which you generally don't do. But this is how I wanted to get the shot, right? So we, we, we made it safe for him. But his whole body was vibrating. I remember after the shot, his whole body, he had such an adrenaline rush. And, um, and I looked at the, the, the padding on his body and on his hand. And there were these little uh, marks where, the, where the, uh, the flash had come out, maybe uh, burning... Um, compression caps or something that, that had had sort of made marks on his body and i was like wow does, does that hurt and he, and he didn't realize that they was like no i didn't feel that i'm just got yeah. a rush and okay i said I, I, can you do it again and he said yeah i i feel bad now because i was thinking he probably didn't feel like he could say no and it was a pretty cool shot um but we got we ultimately got the shot of of richard dean anderson doing a full 360 the, the muzzle flash, the shells flying. And uh, I mentioned the, uh, the lunchtime, uh, the next day daily, the they used to eat lunch. They would, they would eat lunch, they'd go. I'd go like Destin, they go, that shot sucks. <laughs> well, that's pretty funny. <laughs> well, that's okay. No, 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 I ruined that joke, right? That's, that's how they would watch. We'd be killing ourselves to make, get this footage to them. And they, in between burping and slurping, they go, yeah, they kind of got that right. Yeah, that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, and, and you ask Joe next time you uh, talk to him, Malazzi. ask him to deny it. Ask him to deny <laughs> okay. it. Okay. So, yeah. All and right. Going, Do you think we need to reshoot that or right? Yeah, I don't know. No. Uh, so what I, I actually... I ran up there because I wanted to see what their impression was of, of the dailies of that shot. And Richard Dean Anderson going, brah, brah, pop, 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 and it's the big pinnacle. That, and I'm sure, and I'm going, imagine this with the music and the thing. And the, this is the big moment where Richard Dean Anderson saves the day, the giant hero. And while the shot's going and the shells are flying off in every direction, Robert Cooper goes, Richard Dean Anderson is the new poster boy for the NRA. Oh, he's, yeah, yeah, it is kind of pro gun, which was an unfortunate, you know, maybe we should have done it with lasers. Yeah, because well, given I the circumstances, you know, you're going to use what you anti- got. So, well, of course, but I mean, because I'm, I'm originally from the United States. And so I was like, well, this is what was in the script. And it never occurred to me that I was being pro pro gun to solve your problems. But I was like, oh, it is kind of that. It does kind of feel like he's the poster boy for the NRA, and so there was a, there was a, there was a small part of me died in that moment when Robert correctly pointed out that we were flying machine guns. Yeah, but but it was a cool shot, and I, I stand by it. But I had but I had originally intended for it to be the revolver shot that we used on Warrior during the big mm. uh, Capoeira uh, fighting, and the correct pronunciation is Capoeira. Capoeira. Yes, the, the the fights, the fighting style, the Brazilian yes. fighting style is called capoeira. Got yeah. it. We had Rick Worthy on. He was word. amazing. Yeah. Just it's, yeah. what what a brilliant actor. What a brilliant choice for that role. Well, I watched I watched that all the way from start to finish, and I was like, "Come on, man, talk about me. Tell him how great I am." <laughs> and he did this much, but he, I mean, what he's does that guy's voice? Oh, sound like man. butter toast or what? Oh, I could, I, I could listen, listen to him, to him read, read the, the phone book, the dictionary. Yeah, yeah the absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I would not say that this but would be easy. You, you will be free, Jafar. You him, if, yeah, I wrote that. I wrote that. Yeah, with Christopher what Judge as the as the story as yeah. uh, story by. 
Great show. Uh, but I mean, I talked about, I, I wrote that speech is what I'm saying. Ah, gotcha. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a great one. Uh, Eva Lipinska, what is the funniest commentary of the commentaries that you did for Stargate? What, what's your favorite? I mean, of me, you want me to be, you want me to compliment me? Well, I mean, they're all wonderful. <laughs> Let's say, let's say I, for people who haven't uh, listened to the DVD commentaries, who hopefully still have the DVD sitting somewhere, which one would you would you suggest that they pull out and listen to the DVD commentary? That's how I that was how I think that she's she's phrasing it. Well, well, I I think they're all. Uh, I think uh, this is what I I suggest. I I can't tell you which is the funniest, but if you take your your favorite episode. If you're if you're looking for commentary that I did, you know, just I would just go watch your favorite episode and then and watch the commentary. Because what I would do, the, the reason I'm answering it this way is because I have no recollection of what was the funniest. Okay. Because I couldn't I couldn't answer that. It's I been a while. I can't give that any. I can't credibly answer that question. Um, but um, what I would do is when it when it when it came when it came to be my turn, I if. If they were available, you know, I would call uh, Gary Jones and Dan Shea and or, and I would ask them to 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 come because I would like I want to want to bounce off of somebody. Mm. But sometimes I would do them all by myself, and um, I, my 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 thought process was these are very dry and they can be incredibly boring, and part of the and I wasn't being paid any more money. For that, I was doing it out of the the, the, the gener- generosity of my out of my heart, right? and and also the love of filmmaking. I was mm. doing it for that, but the, but but w- the 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 upside of that was when when somebody had to decide whether they were going to rent or buy the disc. If if they if they were going to rent it, they wouldn't have time to listen to the filmmakers' commentary. So they so they, what they found was if it had deleted scenes in filmmakers commentary people would tend to buy the, mm. the, what we call sell through units they would tend to buy the units so they they would make more money on that on that labor right and so i was like yeah i'm i'm, I'm happy to do that you, you don't have to compensate me for that but i was going to have fun doing it and i wasn't going to do something dry or boring uh either so i and i'm a huge fan of mystery science 3 uh, <laughs> 2000 so i was like yeah i'm totally going to go there and i did as much as i could yeah. absolutely Goran Andonowski, out of all the Stargate shows that you directed, which one stands out as your favorite? Well, Ergo, yeah. Ergo for sure, because I got to work with my dad and it was so funny. And yeah. I, I think a lot of people have that in there. I know, I know Window of Opportunity is uh, is a huge uh, fan favorite as well. That huge. was That was a joy. Not, not a lot of people, uh, and and of course, uh, Wormhole Extreme, because I got to work with my brother Mike. And, that was about it. And, and, you know, and I got to work with my brother David in, a, in an episode that I wrote and directed. So that was kind of cool too. Uh, well, working with my family was always a highlight. I know window of opportunity, which whenever I read the fan, when I read the fan uh, thing, I, I see, I see this yes. and I go, what is woo? What is what you mean? Oh, oh, it's window of opportunity again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it comes up so, so often they created a shorthand for it. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, not a lot of people. I don't. I watched. I watched you do a. I watched you do a, a, an episode on that, and then I was like, "Well, I don't know if this was covered, but it became obvious almost immediately because of the Groundhog Day thing. That when you do Groundhog, you don't have a, a gazinta or a gazada, which is slang for people walking up and going boing, right? So so you just start as late as you can, which was the door opening or him eating uh, Fruit Loops. And we had to glue the Fruit Loops so that they would all be in the exact <laughs> same spot every time. And that's why we glued them. I, I know that they came up before us because I actually brought that up in the concept meeting and they go like, what do you mean you have to glue them? I said, well, if the green one's on the tip and uh, this time, but if the green one's on, on, the, on the back and the next time, then everybody's gonna know it's different. You have to glue it yeah. to the thing. So he could, even time if he resets wanted to show the right in the thing, middle of the pickup of the, of the spoon. That's right. So it had to be exact. And so that's where my head was. And there, everybody went, you could see them all go, oh, yeah, it's going to have to be glued. You can't move. The, and Rick the, drops the it on the thing. third one. So, I mean, they have to be on there pretty good. I, so. I think I'm, I'm pretty sure we had I'm pretty sure we had multiples. And if we didn't 
then that would have been a mistake. But it was definitely <laughs> not going to move. It was those Fruit Loops were on that spoon the way they were exactly supposed to be. But one of the things that happened when I, when you talked in the Joe about uh, woo, woo, the the that it became clear almost immediately that we were going to come in under, which was very rare that that we were going to ever come in under, and and so. I went upstairs and I said, hey, uh, our timing is coming way under. We're going to have to come up with more stuff for the montage. To think. So some of the things that came up was the juggling. Like I just asked him, well, what can you do? And Chris and RDA go, I go, can you guys juggle? Which is something I ask actors all the time. Because if they can, I'm like, hey, that'd be cool. If you... And they both could juggle. I was like, wow. let's have you juggle. <laughs> they go, great. So they, they really do juggle in real life. I said, well, let's do that. And then um, the bice going to the thing. Hey, Vern, the bicycle thing. That right. was new. The, 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 the golf thing. That was all made up after the fact. Wow. And I think the Callaway golf bag, I think, I think, um, I think Brad wanted a new uh, golf set, golf club <laughs> set. So he, he was like, hey, if we put Callaway and we put this nice bright light, you know, shining right right on the Callaway uh, bag. And, and so that was heavily featured. And, and I think Brad ended up with the Callaway bag. In, in, in the <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So let me, yeah, so, so we had to come up with a whole bunch wow. of extra little things to fill out the time, which made it even more fun. Right. So, th- so this is news to me. So the montage was planned, but it was not supposed to be as long as it was. It, w- it was not nearly uh, as extensive. I thought the montage Absolutely. was created from whole cloth because it was short. Okay. Did you know that you were? Mo- well, we, we, it was because we were short. I don't yeah. know how much of the montage was, but it was definitely. You can't do a. You can't do. A, you can't do a time loop. You can't do a, a Groundhog Day, or and then there's yeah. this new wonderful one with Adam Adam Sandler, uh, not Adam Sandler, Adam. Uh, but what's it called? Palm Springs. That's a good one. Okay. That that one that just came out on Netflix. I highly recommend that. You one. have to experiment that, that with your situation, it. and that's what that montage does. Totally. Say, totally. Just I go think. to town. So, did you know that you had a gem when you were directing that one? Especially with Rick's speech uh, at the end. I I I I didn't know how well received it would be, but I did know. Uh, there was some, it, it was very dramatic at the end. And oh, by the way, the act, the, the lovely lady at the end, who's wife of the, of the, of the guy of Robin, mm-hmm. uh, that is Nicole, who was the wife of Peter West, our DP, who was also the head of accounting. And, and wow. she was the, the vision. She was the, she was the wife that, that, that he was trying the to say. little thing that he pulls out. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's right. What a great solid show. Trace. I, I did not know. I thought, I thought people might like it, but I didn't know how much they would like it. It's brilliant. It's, it's, it's top five easily. Tracy wanted to know, is there a project that you would like to work on yet that you haven't had an opportunity to explore before? Yes, I, I would like to work on a show, um, uh, a single camera comedy, uh, you know, uh, like uh, something like a Schitt's Creek or a, or a, or a The Office. I know that the, that's a bit of a cliche because everybody always says The Office. Uh, extras comes to mind. Um, that where where the where the the little guy, the underdog, is is being championed, but it but it but you but it's uh, rife with the humanity and and, mm. the, and the comedy. There's uh, so much good television on now. You know, I think we were really yes, entering the golden age for, of, of TV because we're finally telling, you know, the miniseries has finally caught fire. I was a huge fan of the Stephen King miniseries, the ABC miniseries of of, nine, of the 90s. And, you know, we're finally really you know, catching up I to just, that. I just watched The Stand, the one that, that just came on. The, it's wonderful. The Very new wonderful. one? You like you, you like the new one? Yeah. I Pretty haven't awesome. started it yet. I'm I'm a I'm a Corin loyalist for one thing, so I'll we'll, we'll see. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Um, well, you 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 can watch it and then not tell anybody. I won't, I won't tell. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Uh, what was your experience working on Sanctuary like? Chantel Leo wants to know. Sanctuary was was pretty cool because it has a, a sort of a, a steampunk version of uh, Men in Black. 
uh, that kind of feel to it, right? And uh, uh, Damian Kindler and Amanda Tapping and uh, Martin Wood uh, were the uh, the uh, showrunners on that, and that and that I thought that that was a great, and they and they were they so they pretty much made that happen for themselves, which I thought was which was amazing. Um, I enjoyed the 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 noir. Uh, the old timey uh, feel of it. I thought the uh, at one point during the uh, the sizzle reel, there was one the first little bit that when it was going to be originally it was conceived that it would be a um, an internet show or like a web show, mm-hmm. and uh, it was before its time, and mm-hmm. and they couldn't get, make that work, and so they they just made a proper show out of it. And uh, yeah, I. If I had a hat on, I would tip it to them. That's uh, oh, I've got my dad's hat here. This is it. Hey, I I tip my hat. I I tip my hat to them because they really made that happen. Ryan Robbins, what an amazing uh, dude, Uh, Robin. Yeah, uh, he's brilliant. Robin Dunn. Robin Dunn, and uh, of course Chris Hiredall. Oh my God, I love that guy. Guy's brilliant. We're wanting to get him on the show, so. One of these days. Um, what do you think of uh, Peter Do- of Peter Dulles? I'm talking with Peter Dulles. Uh, Jet Ice. Peter Dulles is awesome. Very handsome. <laughs> Very uh, handsome. My coup. Uh, what What do you think of uh, Teal'c becoming the god of war? Christopher Judge is now Kratos. I couldn't be happier for him. He's got. Uh, an amazing voice. He's uh, an excellent uh, actor, and um, I thought I thought that that was um, that was a long time coming because he he's such an amazing voice actor. Anyway, I mean he's a, a wonderful actor in general, but the, but he's a he's a he's a very gifted voice actor, and his his uh, his voice is is exactly the kind of power you need for that character. So I thought that that was that was very appropriate. So I'm happy for. Him. I wanted to know, Peter, last before I let you go, would you do Dagwood for you me? You're going to let me go? Yeah, I've got to bring Elise on in a minute here. Oh, Elise, of course. She's awesome. She Tell is. her hi from me. I will. You can say hello to her if you stay on for a second. Okay. Yeah. What? So what, what, was the, what was the question? Could you do Dagwood for me? Oh, you want me to do Dagwood for you? So Dagwood, uh, one of the things that I did uh, with Dagwood, because he was new to the world around him, and because I, I, I imagine because he was the prototype, it hadn't got quite gotten him right. So I would I would make my voice be in my throat, and I used uh, my niece at the time had just started talking, and one of the things that I would say, say, say Dada, and she'd go mm, Dada. So she like warm up her vocal cords and then say it, right? And I was like, well, I'm going to use that. <laughs> and so I imagine that the vocal cords weren't quite fully developed. And so I'm like, I was saying, Dag was a Dag was a prototype. I'm the prototype, and that's why I'm here, right? And then I was also I was also thinking of uh, Lenny from Of Mice and Men. <laughs> right but his, right. his his youthful his inner his inner child coming out and being just just in, in, impressed with everything and having his own little uh, speech uh, problem so if somebody were to say to him hold on and he didn't understand what that meant like he, invariably people hold on to a bulk at it. so i just went like i didn't know what that was right and um <laughs> i also knew that my character would have been trained not unlike the soldier that Kurt Russell played in, um, uh, I guess it's called The Soldier, right? Is that think... the one where he, Soldier? I'm trying to remember. I'm not it's not Universal sure. Soldier, but yeah. So, but, yeah. so he was bred to be a, a humanoid combatant, right? right? That's why I said H-A-C on my chest. Yes. It was humanoid, humanoid assisted combat, H-A-C, which was really... I had stolen the shirt from the Hollywood Athletic Club, <laughs> and I, I couldn't come up with it. So they, what you never really saw what it said until when I when I finally undid it, they 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 recreated the Hollywood Athletic Club shirt and made it 
HAC and then put a, a, a strip on the bottom and in humanoid assisted combat. So we made it make sense after that. Yeah, I was watching. But I would, I would, I would, I would, I would, I would, all my voice was coming from here. And sometimes I would scream to make my, my voice a little bit rough. David, I really enjoy being on your show. It's the best. <laughs> Thank you, sir. It was tremendous having you. I'd love to have you back at some point here in the future. There are so many stories to tell, and it's been a blast uh, having you on, truly. Well, I've enjoyed myself hanging out with you, and the fact that you do this show without uh, pants is just extraordinary. I think it's We amazing. weren't supposed to tell anyone that. <laughs> I do have pants. They're just not long. <laughs> Peter DeLuise, my friend, uh, it means so much to me to have you on. Be well, sir. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Which is which is what my what my niece would say as well. We'd say thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Uh -huh. so when, when I when I say when I blew the ballast and I saved the whole ship and and Roy Scheider said, "Dag, when you did it, thank you." Welcome. Actually, he says. Actually, he says, very good. And you say, thank you <laughs> in that particular scene. Are you scene. sure? Are you, are, you, are you sure I didn't say welcome? Prove me wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, I'll catch you. If you want to stick around for Elise, um, she's going to be coming in in just a couple minutes here. I'm going to wrap up the show, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Catch you in a minute, man. Peter DeLuise, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you're enjoying the program. We have a new giveaway for the month of April. Dial the Gate is partnered with Big J Customs Art for the month of April to give you a chance to get your very own custom pop figure. To enter to win one, you just need a desktop or laptop computer to visit dialthegate.com. Scroll down to submit trivia questions and your trivia that you submit to us may be used in a future episode of Dial the Gate. Please note the submission form does not currently work for mobile devices. Your trivia must be received before uh, May the 1st, 2021. And if you're the lucky winner, I'll be notifying you via your email to get your address and be sure to check out our partner's website at bigjcustomsart.com uh, we have elise levesque coming up in just a few moments here so we're going to go ahead and uh, get the show ready for her if you like the program please consider clicking that like button uh, leaving a comment sharing some love uh, share this with a uh, stargate fan if you uh if you have one in your life. Hopefully all of you have one in your life. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. I really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks again for my moderating team. You guys are the, uh, the best. And thank you again to Peter DeLuise for making this show possible. We'll see you on the other side.